Hello AP Calculus AB students, Mr. Record here for video number seven covering our topic 6.2, really all about Riemann sums. And we're going to introduce um, kind of a different type of sum. It's not so much a Riemann sum as Riemann sums are associated with rectangular shapes. So we're going to call this a trapezoidal sum. And I'm just hanging from the rafters, as you can tell, and I'm really excited to show you this. So let's take a look at the trapezoidal sum. So as you can see, where am I? Oh, here I am. I'm down here, you guys. <laughs> so as you can see here, uh, we've got uh, a slightly different kind of shape on our hands. And I think most of you probably recall from geometry what a trapezoid shape looks like. In fact, we've even talked about it a little bit in our class leading up to this video. But the way that this trapezoid is oriented, it might remind you of some old stories that you may have heard from maybe great grandparents that have been passed down how they didn't have the kind of bathrooms that you and I had right and they had to go out to these things called outhouses and you see here in the upper right hand corner a picture of an outhouse it's basically a, a small uh, somewhat cubical rectangular shaped building but it does have a slanted roof that will allow for the rain or the snow to drain off but if you really get a good look at this from the side it really would be the shape of one of the trapezoids that we're talking about in these figures. So think outhouses and you've got your trapezoid. So what is this trapezoidal sum? Well, it's born out of something that we call the trapezoidal rule that you can see in this very hideous orange box. Let F be continuous on some closed interval AB. The trapezoidal rule for approximating the area under a curve is given by area is approximately, what does this say? B minus A over 2N times F of X0 plus 2F of X1 plus 2F of X sub 2 plus 2F of X sub 3 plus 2F of X sub 4 plus dot 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 2F of X sub N minus 1 plus F of X N. And that will conclude the video. Hopefully you understand this and you're able, no. We're just kidding. Obviously, that formula is very intimidating. And to be honest, you really don't need to know this formula. You're going to be able to incorporate your ideas of trapezoidal area without knowing much about this formula. Now, that being said, I would like to talk to you just briefly about how this formula is arrived at because I think that can give you a greater understanding of where we're headed down the line. So let's do this this way. I'm going to draw a little graph. Yeah, right there it is. I'm going to draw the graph right there. So you've got this sketch, let's say. And just kind of sit back and watch this. You don't really need to make any documentation. So if I've got some curve that looks so something like that would work. And I'll define this curve on some interval A to B. And just for the sake of argument, I'm going to call A uh, the origin here, right, uh, where x is 0. So what do we mean when we say trapezoid sum? Well, let's say that I decide to divide this into four subintervals, just for the sake of argument. And I would draw my little vertical line segments up to the curve. And when we talk trapezoid rule, we're talking about capping off each of these shapes by going endpoint to endpoint like this. And you can see by doing that, we have four shapes. And these three here certainly would be trapezoids. Now, I purposely wanted my A to be located here where the curve crosses the the uh, x-axis, the origin, because sometimes you get this degenerate version of a trapezoid that really is more like a triangle. But in some weird universe, you could think of a triangle as being a trapezoid where one of the two bases is a zero, and it has the same characteristics. So how does this formula come into play? Well, first and foremost, it is vitally important that you guys all have a working understanding of the formula for the area of a simple trapezoid. You have to know that. You simply take half of the sum of the bases and multiply by the height. Now, how does that parlay into this wacky formula that you see here? 
Well, let's take a look. We'll break it down piece by piece. In other words, where do you think this 2 comes from in this denominator in your formula? Well, it probably is the 2 that's located in the denominator of the main trapezoid rule formula. It's that 1 half multiplier. So that's taken care of. All right, let's go on to some other part. How about this b minus a portion all divided by n? Where do you think that's coming from? Well, if you look very carefully over here, you're going to see this value h. And that h value, which is the bottom of our outhouse, <laughs> or the bottom of each of these trapezoids, is basically the entire span of the interval b minus a divided by how many different subintervals you're going to use. We talked about how that was the width of our Riemann sum rectangles. Now it's going to serve as the height of our trapezoid. So I hope that makes sense. And if it doesn't, I honestly would suggest that you might want to rewind the video and just listen to that explanation again. Try to conjure up the picture and I think you'll be able to make that connection. B minus A over N is just the same as H. So the only thing that's left is all of the sums of the bases. Now you're going to notice that these bases kind of have some inconsistencies to them. Notice how there's these coefficients of 2 in front of the interior values. But the two out values here on the outside do not have that coefficient of 2. Well, that's easily explained. And the reason is because these outside values do not have double usage. In other words, we're only going to use this one time here, and we're only going to use this base one time over here. That serves as those two. On the inside of this guy, as you can see, this particular distance here is going to serve as both the base of trapezoid one and the base of a trapezoid number two. We can say the same thing about this guy here. He's going to be the base on this side and a base on that side, etc., etc. And so that's why we have these interior twos. But I promise you, you can still get 100% of your trapezoidal sum questions correct without ever having to use this formula. And we're going to talk about that. But if you feel comfortable with the formula, it can be a quick way to start your setup. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example here, number seven. It says, use the trapezoid rule to approximate the area under f of x equals sine of x and above the x-axis on the interval 0 to pi, and it asks you to use four trapezoids. All right, And so you can see that the graph is already placed, uh, put together for us, which is kind of nice. And we already have our partitions that we want, right? We have four separate partitions, so I've always advised students to make sure that you uh, keep tabs of those values of x that you're going to use and simply draw segments that go from those points up to the curve. Now you'll notice at 0 and pi there's no segment to draw and it's because our two n shapes really are going to be these degenerate trapezoids that we like to call triangles. Next we can just connect endpoint to endpoint and you can see how the trapezoids are formed now. And your job would be to find the area of all of those shapes added together. Now, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to use this formula for the area of the trapezoid in this particular example. Now, when we move on to our next video, example eight, which I highly suggest that you tune in for, we're going to take a little bit of a different approach and not use the formula. So for our area, I'll say area using trapezoids, A sub T, the approximation would be you take B minus A, which in this case is pi minus 0, and you're going to divide that 
by 2 times n, where n is 4. Next up, we take our function, which is, of course, the sine function, sine of x, and we're going to evaluate it at x0. Now, you probably haven't given this a whole lot of thought yet, but the left endpoint we typically refer to as a, but it also can go by the name x sub 0. They are the same thing. Now, if you're wondering, why doesn't the formula just use a here? Because that's what we're using in this spot. Well, they wanted to preserve this sort of count up for x0, x1, x2, all the way to xn. And it made that a lot easier to avoid using a at the front and b at the back. And so therefore, they used x sub 0 and x sub n. And then likewise, this pi, as I just indicated, is going to be the b value, which is also x sub n. So we start with sine of 0. And then to that, we will add our multiplier of 2 times the sine of our next value, which in our graph is pi over 4. You see how that works? We're going to continue that same idea, multiply by 2 times the sine of pi over 2 add to that. I'm kind of running out of space, so I'm just going to continue down here. 2 times the sine of 3 pi over 4, and then we can end it off with our pi value, but notice we will not put a 1 coefficient in front because he is only going to be used one time. And once we simplify this expression, we have the area approximation that we want. So we would have pi over 8 at the front, and then hopefully you all see that the sine of 0 is, of course, 0. The sine of pi over 4, that's going to be a, a radical 2 over 2. And the sine of pi over 2, that's going to be 1. The sine of 3 pi over 4, well, you're talking about quadrant 2 there in the unit circle sine is positive in quadrant 2, so we can still use square root of 2 over 2. Notice I'm using the rationalized version of 1 over square root of 2 here. It's going to make those 2's cancel nicely. And then finally, the sine of pi, which we all know is 0. And by the time this is simplified a little further, you're going to get pi over 8 times square root of 2 plus 2 plus square root of 2 and those two square root of twos will combine. And you can finally call your answer something along the lines of 2 plus 2 root 2. There's a lot of other things that you can do with this. Maybe factor out a 2 and let it reduce that 8, which it's a possibility that you could see some kind of crazy multiple choice question that might yield that result. And you might wonder where it's coming from. But that would be our actual approximated area using four trapezoid sums for the sine of x. Now, I said at the beginning, you don't have to rely on using this particular formula all the time. And I stand by that statement. So for instance, let's say that you entered this problem and you weren't quite sure how to set this up and you didn't know this formula at all. All that you would have to do is just write let's use a better color than gray, is you would just simply write four different trapezoid formulas for each of those four rectangles. For example, rectangle one, or trapezoid one, would just simply be one half times the sum of the bases, which is zero and the sine of pi over four, right? That's how tall each of those two bases are. would then be multiplied by the height, which is the distance from here to here, which is pi over 4. And that would take care of the entire first trapezoid. All you would then proceed to do is add to that a similar formula for the second trapezoid. And I'm just going to do this one in a stop. But that would be 1 half times the quantity sine of the pi over 4 plus the sine of pi over 2. And then all of that would be multiplied by the width of the trapezoid, 
which is pi over 4 again. So that pi over 4 would be right up here after that. And then you would do the same thing for trapezoid 3 and trapezoid 4. Right? And you kind of start to see that the reason why this formula works up here for this problem is because you have an equal subinterval length. That's not always going to be the case, and that's what we're going to discuss in our next video in example A. Hope this helps, and we'll see you next time.